Okay, so you should be able to see it. Just a quick slide over. Is that good for everyone? All right, perfect. Good. Winning exactly for 102 here. All right, exactly 102. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, I know a lot of you all are from side parks. Um, first off, I would like to welcome you to NCAR. Uh, I hope the campus and the experiences that you all have had have been spectacular as of mine. Like, I don't know, this is such a beautiful place. So I really appreciate everyone coming to attend. Talk. So, okay. For everyone else, also welcome. Um, our HPC section here, right, is very robust. Um, our group is very dedicated to HPC. So, I want to like just give everyone a great warm welcome here, right, because we're all like trying to help us get good science done. So, thanks everybody for showing up. And hopefully, this can answer all the questions that you have just on getting started on the system. Okay. Cool. Um, my name is Mia Traham. I'm part of the CISL Consulting Group, uh, part of the HPC group entirely, I'm specifically part of the team CSG. And yeah, I do want to point a link out to our documentation page. All the stuff that we're going to be talking about today are going to be listed in this location. So if you forget anything, right, you have any additional questions, right, and you don't want to send an email, right, try scrubbing through the documentation to make sure Right, but of course, if you want to send an email, we're always friendly. We're always happy to respond. So, yeah, cool. So first off, I just want to do this quick little pledge here, right? So this is all boilerplate stuff, but yeah, of course, we're committed to providing a safe and productive environment. Um, yeah, I'll let you all like know about this, but of course, NCAR is very welcoming to everybody. So yeah, um, expected behaviors. I know you all know this. Um, yeah, just treat everyone with respect and. Be considerate. Cool. Now, again, one last time, thank you for joining us today. Uh, so a few things to note before we really get started here. This tutorial is going to be recorded. So if you're a little bit uncomfortable about like having your voice recorded, right, you can feel free to just type in chat. We have someone that's going to be parroting or reading off the chat messages for us. So yeah, not too concerning, right? But yeah. Next. Um, if you have, if you can turn off your computer audio or your phone, right, just make sure everything's good to go. I want it to be as smooth as possible. Uh, and lastly, please turn off your Zoom video. Uh, it limits bandwidth, and sometimes we've had connection issues with people. So yeah, if you want to get like the full experience, please, please, please turn off your Zoom video. Okay. Cool. Now, just a quick rundown of all the topics we're going to be talking about today. So first off, we're going to be talking about, of course, the HPC systems, like, you know, we're walking around NCAR, but, you know, you didn't see any huge computers or anything, right? So, like, where are they? Where are they? Who are they? You know, what kind of features do they all have? Um, we'll talk about the SAM. That's going to be your management resource in terms of actually checking to see your allocation and how much resources you're currently using. We'll talk about how you access the system. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the data storage and the specifications of that. We'll talk about the software environment and what modules you can load. Then we'll go into a job and a batch job, more specifically a batch job. And then we'll go into like a few more additional kind of resources, right? That allow you to actually analyze and construct plots of your data. Okay, cool. So first off, let me ask you that grand question. Like, so you probably have walked through the NCAR campus entirely and, you know, there's not any huge computers here, right? Like, you know, there's no big resource here. Well, that's because all of them actually exist in this facility up in Wyoming. So this is the NWSC. This is the NCAR data center located in Cheyenne. 
um, yeah, we pulled that in around 2012 to accommodate our first HBC system because obviously our campus isn't like equipped for that facility. And overall, it's better for energy kind of constraints as well. It's currently home to our NWSC2 Cheyenne supercomputer. And a little plug of future here, we're also bringing in NWSC3 pretty soon named Derecho, which I'll have a slide here for y'all to take a look at. Quick little stats here is of course LEED Gold Certified um, and it's a green data center. So we're trying to conserve as much resources, oh, conserve as much energy as possible. Um, it's primary cooled by natural cooling. So yeah, and just a few other like, you know, the native landscape, of course, it tries to complement that and stuff like that. So, you know, little weird, little nuances that are super cool about it. And here's the actual picture of the machine. Okay. And this is the one that you're currently be using, but in the future you'll be using another one called the ratio, which we also have a slide on. So this is Cheyenne. It is a SGI ICE XA supercomputer. That's actually the chassis that's actually built into, but um, yeah, it's the second system supercomputer system we've ever deployed at NWSC in our production around January, 2017. And just for reference here, right? Computer technology usually advances relatively quickly, right? But you know, it debuted as number 21 in the world's top 500 supercomputers, right? It, well, I guess number, number 100 in November 21 here, right? So yeah, as you can see, like as technology progresses, those computers eventually like kind of fall off, but it's still extremely powerful and still has tons of resources for real to use. So there's 4,032 compute nodes. Now, a question here for anyone, do you all know what a node is versus like a CPU? Yeah, okay, so well, I'm gonna break this all down. So how this all is, right? So it's like three major hierarchies, right? You have a node, you have a CPU, and then you have a specific core, right? All of your computers are all equipped with one CPU with a certain amount of cores, right? To perform workloads that are more manageable, right? That you would expect on your machines, right? Um, this is much more complicated, right? Where there's a ton of these like smaller CPUs, right? And loaded up with cores, all bound together with this really fast fabric, right? That we go ahead and link together, right? That you'll go ahead and network and create this large kind of compute cluster, right? So there's 4,032 of these large like laptops all stacked together, right? In this big data center, right? And they total with about 145,000 cores. So they're dual socket, right? So there's actually two CPUs per node, each with 18 cores. So when you request one node, you'll get 36 cores, okay? And this is a 2.3 gigahertz Intel Xenon processor. That's actually a really old processor, right? Again, 2017. So yeah, we're gonna be seeing a pretty substantial upgrade here relatively soon. And you have 313 terabytes of total system memory. Now I'm not talking about storage, right, not disk space. This is like, you know, volatile RAM. So each node is gonna be equipped with 64 gigabytes per node, right, with single rig DIMMs for most of them, right? And if you need a little bit more, you can actually request a 128 gigabyte node, right, dual rank DIMM. Um, we only have about 800 of these though, so it's a little bit more of a, you know, smaller resource, yes. What is single rank, single rank DIMM? Um, so, what I think, I'm not actually super sure what single rank and dual rank. Is. Yeah. Okay. So the question was, what's the difference between single rank DIMMs and dual rank DIMMs? So from my understanding, there's probably two like sets of DIMM slots, right? So there's actually two sets of more RAM and sticks can actually be placed into it, right? So they're actually closer to the CPUs and, you know, you should be able to fit more memory in there in general. A single rank, on the other hand, is probably just gonna be one set of slots, right, with some DIMMs. I can't confirm this. This is my kind of speculation here, but yeah. Okay, awesome. <laughs> yep. Okay, any other questions? Oh, perfect. Okay, and we also have six login nodes. So there is a big difference here, right? When you actually log into the machine, you'll be placed onto a login node. These aren't actually set up for any kind of heavy computational workflow, right? They're just there for you to like, you know, move some files over or do some general kind of workflow things to keep your work organized, right? 
Um, these are dual socket, uh, there's some memory on them, but yeah, they're really not designed for a lot of like, you know, your general kind of workflows. So make sure, be a kind neighbor here, right? And don't run like any big application on login modes. Okay, cool. And here's our documentation page. Uh, yes. It was green when he asked when uh, I was asked to fix it though. So you switch it back. Mm -hmm. I switched it back and forth, yeah. yeah. You're saying that they cannot hear Mia. Uh, Asia mentioned that yeah, they cannot hear you. I think something might be. Yeah, I think the I think there might be like some technical difficulty. We good? We good? Okay. Cool. Is, is this good? Okay, they're saying no. Okay. <laughs> Can you turn off the microphone now, please? Off. Okay, go ahead. Um, should I ask my question? Or... Yeah, oh, okay, 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 okay. So um the fact that there are six login notes, does this mean that at any given time no more than six people can be like moving piles around and doing workflow stuff on Cheyenne? That is an excellent question. No, thank God. That would be way too little in terms of resources, right? You actually, these are all shared, right? So when you walk into a node, right, you're allocated a certain percentage of the system, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're basically sharing all the CPUs, right, with whoever else is logging in. Right. The reason we actually have six is for a load balancing issue and a backup issue. So if any one of the nodes actually goes down, right, we don't have any problems, right, actually maintaining the load of any more users still coming on, right, while we can repair it. Okay. Cool. Awesome question, though. Thanks so much. Okay. Cool. Now we're going to talk about another cluster we have here, right? This is, I don't know if you all know this, but we also have another cluster called Casper. Um, it is actually a heterogeneous cluster, and it's designed for more visualization workflows. Well, I guess actually a ton of other things, right? It's visualization, high throughput computing, right? That's actually like creating a ton of tiny jobs, right? That go ahead and like submit and like compute all like against one data set, right? And crunch out a bunch of dumb numbers, right? And some large memory jobs. So if you have like an application that's gonna require like several terabytes or like a terabyte of memory, right? then this is the place you would go ahead and submit. Okay, so yeah, there's a ton of different things here. I'm not gonna go over everything besides like the things that I kind of pointed out here. Um, yeah, we also have GPU nodes here, right? They're actually gonna be incorporated into the RAID chain when that comes in, but for now, um, yeah, this is our currently our 10 and additionally six more coming in, right, of our GPU nodes, yes. Type of note to use on whether it's GPU or that's an excellent question. Um, yes. So the question was, do you need to specify specific features in the node or a very specific like type of node inside your job submission? Um, sort of. What you actually do is you specify the resources that you want, right? And it'll go ahead and allocate based on the resources that you've requested, right? So if you request something that needs 1.5 terabytes. Right, then it'll be moved over to the high memory nodes. Okay. Okay, cool. We have another documentation page here. This is an entirely separate section. I'll get, I'm gonna go ahead and show everybody what this documentation page looks like. Right, so again, this like 
indiv like individualized like little locations here, right? So if you want to see specifics on launching a job here, right? Then you can go ahead and like click starting jobs on Casper, right? And then you'll get some examples as well. It's a really handy environment. Um, and I know you all can't see this too well, but yeah, um, just know that this documentation page exists. It's super cool. Okay. So, and the last picture in the supercomputer that we're going to talk about is going to be our new HPC named Derecho. Um, this is brand new. It hasn't been completely released yet. So wait for, so for a little bit more, or wait a little bit more, and then we'll eventually have this out for everybody. But yeah, we're super proud of this. It's going to be a Cray HPC cluster, right? So things are going to be a slightly different in terms of how like the OS is kind of structured and the tools that you'll have, but it's going to be much more or much more capable. Um, so we have AMD Epic Milan processors in there, right? And these processors are pretty awesome because they have a large amount of cache actually built into them, meaning that they're just in general faster in terms of computing like raw data, right? So it's actually super useful. Um, and these cores or these processors come with a ton of cores equipped. I'm not super sure how many are in each uh, processor. It looks like it's 128 per node, right? So there's a ton of cores that you can get just on one node, okay? So yeah, even though it says like, you know, 2,488 CPUs, it looks a little bit smaller, right? The compute, pro or compute power of this is much, much, much more capable. So yeah, um, just some other stats here. Yeah, we have CPU nodes, GPU nodes actually coming in as well. Um, they're A100s, so if you're really into machine learning or any kind of TensorFlow kind of workflows, right, then these are your nodes. <laughs> like, please hit them up. And lastly, we have eight login nodes, of course. Um, these actually have GPUs actually built in them as well. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> we also have a documentation homepage that I don't think I can show you because I think it's a little bit too, oh, there it is. So it's a little bit too far down. <laughs> but yeah, very cool, yes. How do the Tensor Core GPUs kind of differ from like the TPU setup, like Google one kind of, I, I, I'm just not familiar with Tensor Core GPU versus just like a TPU. Yeah, so the major difference is that Tensor, okay, so the question was, what's the difference between like a Tensor processing unit, right, versus like, you know, a kind of GPU that has this kind of technology built into it. So. The major difference is that since it's GPU workloads, right, it can be kind of diversified beyond just machine learning workloads, right? So if you wanted to do big, like large processing on a GPU, right, any sort of capacity, like you're doing like, I don't know, a ton, a ton, a ton of like FFPs or something, right? Then, you know, since it's like kind of simple mathematics and back end, right? Then yeah, it's a great place to actually do it. So it's like just a little bit more generalized than a specific TPU. Yes. Hello, uh, I am doing postdoc here in Cyrus, and I am using the Cyan supercomputer. So, if we want to move on to some others like uh, Casper or Dereco, like what will be the procedure? Okay, so that process is a little bit more like kind of beyond the extent of this talk. So, I'm not going to talk too much about it, right? But the process is going to be relatively simple in terms of actually moving your workload over. It's mainly just moving your storage over, right, and then. I think your allocation is going to be already ported over to Derecho. I'm not super sure on the details of that, but yeah, that's essentially going to be the idea when that comes out. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, thanks everybody for the questions. That's awesome. Any questions in chat? Huh? Okay, perfect. Yes, question. I was just wondering why the eight login notes, it seems it's saying that the login nodes also have GPUs? Um, yes, so this is primarily, so primarily I believe what this is for is it's gonna be like for visualization kind of workflows, right? If you wanna use like uh, VNC or something, right? Then you'll need to have a GPU to actually connect to that application, right? So we have those there for your kind of convenience. It's also really useful for any kind of comp compilation that you need to have, right? To have an exact uh, replica of the GPU inside the login node. Right, so if you're doing like small compilation workload or compilation, then yeah, that's a good place to do it. Thank you. Yep. 
Okay, thanks to everyone for the questions. I love an interactive group. Cool. Um, I'm gonna, I need to hide this chat bar. Apologies, everybody. This thing is not everything, so we'll hide it like. Oh, thanks so much. All right, perfect. Okay, so the next thing we'll talk about here is the system account manager or also known as SAM. Um, so this is gonna be the place where you actually do a lot of your project management, right? So checking to see how many cores you use, checking to see like, you know, your group or how much your group has used or checking like your previous jobs, sorry, to see how much those have used, right? This is the kind of place where you do that. Um, yeah, you can also change some default user settings, right? Like say you don't want bash anymore, you want TCH, right? Then you can go ahead and switch that using SAM, okay? But yeah, just basically some query information, right? And management to make sure that, you know, you're not over out and you're, you're not using too much of the resources or you're not like underusing it. Yep, so you can log into it here. I'll go ahead and pull it up for us. And I will go ahead and send myself a push. It's gonna look a little bit different. I have an admin panel, so it's a little bit different than you, but this is the base kind of resource that you can look at, right? So if I wanted to go ahead and like check specific things regarding my project, right? Then I could go ahead and actually check to see, and you won't see this, it'll be like in preferences and settings and stuff like that. So you'll see this by default, right? You'll see like, oh yeah, here's your different login shells for all the different clusters that we have, right? Your primary group, if you wanted to change that, you could do that there. Uh, we don't actually recommend doing that because it really helps us a lot of, like help you. So please don't try to change your group, right? And car is like a, a really useful feature to have. <laughs> and lastly, we have our home directories, right? Now we'll go ahead and point to certain locations, right? In case you need to look at this. Okay. But yeah, just some generalized accounting information, that, you know, stuff that can be useful for you. Now let's go ahead and actually access the cluster. All right, and this is where we get to the fun part. I know the boilerplate stuff is kind of boring, but let's go ahead and actually do something interactive. So I'm gonna go ahead and just scooch over to the panel here, right? And I'm just gonna go ahead and show you the command that we're gonna run here, right? It's gonna be SSH, right? Your username at cheyenne.ucar.edu, right? So in the slides, there's actually a flag here, dash Y. This is for X11 forwarding, right? So many of you have Macs. Dash Y is how you actually get like forwarding. Like if you say you have a visual application on your machine that you want to like, you know, you want to run like MATLAB or something, right? Then you can have X11 forwarding and actually push out the screen or push out the window to your machine, right? So that's just a nice little feature to have. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future, but just know that this dash Y just enables you to do some more kind of visualization things, okay? Now go ahead and press enter. So you'll get, of course, the password prompt, right? And as you type the password, you'll notice that there's nothing that actually pops up. That's actually a security feature, right? To make sure that no one's looking at your password, right? It's reading all the text you actually pop in, right? So don't worry too much about that. Just make sure, you know, you actually type it in correctly. It's kind of hard to see though. So go ahead and press enter. And then I will get another duo prompt. And this will take me over to the welcome screen of Cheyenne. Yes. So uh, when I do SSH my username uh, into Cheyenne, uh, I get a message which says the authenticity of host Cheyenne.ucar.edu can't be established. And then it shows me some information about like a key. Um, yes, that's an awesome question. Um, that is essentially, when you do your first login, right, your computer doesn't acknowledge the server that you're actually connecting to, right? So all it's doing is asking for one more confirmation that this is the server you wanna to connect to. It should be good to go. So you can go ahead and type yes, and it'll go ahead and get you into the system. Okay, thank you. So after I added my username, um, it did not connect. The message I got was uh, connect to host. Or 22 operation timeout. 
Um, ben, can you take a look at that machine? I appreciate it. Thanks again so much. Yeah, I just want to keep things moving along, so apologies. But yeah, Ben was going to help you out, and you should be able to get into the system. Okay. Oh, was it not accepting your password? Oh. Oh yeah, that means. Um, do you have cap caps lock on or anything? The X on the top. Oh yes, this. Okay. Thank you. Okay, who here is having issues logging in? Okay, I will just go ahead and pop in real quick to check to see. Yes. Oh, yeah. So it is not imperative that everybody be able to log in during this seminar. Um, yeah, yeah, it's okay to skip for now. We'll be, you'll be able to follow along from the slides just fine. Depending upon the details of your mentor and your project assignment, your Cheyenne login may or may not be set up at this moment. Sorry, everyone, that's so chaotic. Um, getting everyone to log in is always like the most crazy thing when we're doing these tutorials. So thanks for bearing with me. Um, if you can't log in, then I do apologize. You might not have your credentials all set up here, but yeah, if you could just follow along, I'm just doing a little bit more demo stuff, right? And the slides are gonna be available for you to follow along, right? With all like little pictures or things like that, right? So you can just follow the examples. Okay, awesome, thanks so much. All right, so now that we're in, right, you're going to get one of the login nodes in Cheyenne, right? It'll be either Cheyenne 1 through 6, right? And if you're doing Casper, which is casper.ucar.edu, you'll get one of the two login nodes on Casper, which is Casper login 1 or 2. Okay? And you can go ahead and see our step-by-step -step process here in case you wanted to see this. Um, I don't usually do dash Y VV, right? Um, the VV is just for your verbosity of, like, errors so if you have an error that pops up right then you might want to have these two vvs set in there right so you can actually see what error message is popping up okay and if you need any other additional two-factor options right you can go ahead and check the cr documentation page here i'm not going to go over them here um but yeah we do have more options for two-factor okay cool and this will go ahead and get us on to our terminal as you can see, it looks exactly the same. Cool. Now, some good citizenship again. Um, again, these resources are shared, right? Or the login nodes are shared. So please, please, please don't run any heavy computational workflows on there, right? Limit your usage to reading and writing text or code, compiling smaller applications, performing data transfers, or interacting with the job scheduler, right? Don't run any Python scripts or like any kind of you know, larger application or model, right, that would end up using the resource, we're gonna kick you off and be like, hey, can you not do that? <laughs> All right, cool. But yeah, thanks again. <laughs> also, please do not attempt to run sudo on any syslog managed systems. I think there's a really scary message that actually comes up if you do that, right? You're not actually gonna get in trouble or anything, right? But it's not gonna work because you obviously do not have admin privileges, right? Because, you know, <laughs> It's a very expensive machine. <laughs> cool. Now, first thing I'm gonna first do is give us kind of a map of where all your files are gonna live, okay? So we're gonna do like a hands-on directed tour here. 
Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is actually run and run a command, right? That's going to give us a preview as to where everything's going to exist. So, right, so we're going to run the command glade dash quota. No dash, sorry, glade quota. Sorry, a little study up here. I'll go ahead and run that, right? And you'll see that we get we get a list of all the different spaces that we have access to for, for our storage, right? And it's also going to give us how much space that's going to be listed in these locations. Okay, so you can see I've used about 134 gigabytes of our work storage, right? And you can see the quota actually associated with this, right? We're going to go over each of these in just a second, but yeah, this is kind of your map. If you want to go ahead and navigate to these directories, I'm sure you all have done some Linux before, right? You just go ahead and you can copy one of these or you can just type it out. I'm going to type it out. Glade. Scratch. M. Trahan. Okay. I can go ahead and type that. And it'll go ahead and pop me over to my Scratch space where I can go ahead and see and put anything that I'd want to actually do any storage or any kind of like major workload. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Is this space only at Shenyan or it is shared by uh, Casper too? That's an excellent question. So there's some spaces that are shared by Sh Okay, so the question was, is there, are all these spaces all shared between all the same different systems? Because we have a ton of different HPC systems. So it really depends, right? But mostly, yes. <laughs> um, so the only thing that really wouldn't transfer over is if you don't have access to certain directories, right? So these directories are all like accessible on most machines, right? So like for your scratch space, right? It's actually accessible through uh through Casper, right? So it's not specified directly on Cheyenne. But if you come across a system, right, say derecho and you don't see that directory anymore, you're not gonna have access to that. Right. So it'll be very apparent that you don't have access to it. Uh, nine times out of ten though, it's all shared. Everything's there. Question. When I use this glade quota function, I can see the first three options, not the last four options, like uh, the sample data or. Yeah, the question was maybe you don't see the same output Mia is showing, and that's true. Everyone should have the first three lines as Mia will describe. Everyone has a work home and scratch space. The others are projects which you may or may not be a member to. Uh, so you certainly won't see identical information in most instances, but published projects, other spaces. All right, thanks for the response here. I really appreciate the detailed answer, everybody. Cool. All right. So yeah, these are your three major spaces, right? Um, and then you'll have additional ones underneath there if you're actually assigned to that project. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually take a look or break down what exactly these file spaces are. So your home directory, right? This is for your most important codes or scripts, settings, things like that, right? So if you have really important information that needs to be saved and always backed up, then you put it in home. Now notice the quota in home. It's only 50 gigabytes, right? And 50 gigabytes is a decent amount, but at the same time, it's much smaller than some of the data sets that you might need to pull in, right? So please don't store any enormous data sets in there, right? Like maybe some results or something that you need to actually like, you know, really keep safe. But generally speaking, you don't want to throw most of the things in home, right? Home is only really for settings and really important kind of codes or scripts, okay? Is backed up, so that's good. Um, and next we have our work directory, right? The major difference between this is that there's no backup, right? And the storage is a lot larger, right? So instead of 50 gigabytes, you'll get one terabyte. And this is primarily used for any kind of compiled applications or any models that you need to have, right? So if you have a model, right, that you compile, you would keep it in that directory, right? Access that, and then you would use any data that you would have in your scratch directory, right? So you would go ahead and like call it from your scratch directory, right? And it'll go ahead and utilize those, uh, use that file into your scratch directory. Okay. Cool. I know it sounds a little bit complicated, but it's really not too bad. Yes. 
So is it fair to say that uh, we will not, that we would not usually have reason to like uh, manually modify stuff in the scratch directory? Like we would be doing our work in the work directory and anything happening in scratch is like the result of processes that we create in work? Um, I don't want to say, so if you're setting up a model, right, that is goes entirely into work. Right, so when you're doing a setup primarily, right, that's going to mostly go into work. But the raw compute, right, all the different mo or all the different data sets you need to pull in for your model to actually compute need to go into Scratch. So if you need to do any setting adjustments in that location, right, you might need to do it there. But generally speaking, most of the work or most of your like kind of startup is going to be in work. I see. Thank you. Yep. Also, is there uh, like w will everything that we be doing? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Will we ever be doing things that do not take place in so uh, in a subdirectory of Glade? Um, I don't believe so. I think it's always under Glade. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yes. Question behind. What do you mean by the parts? Means it will be deleted after one twenty days? Um. Yes. Okay. This is a very good question. I'm going to get to this right now. Uh. Yeah. So scratch space, right? This is actually not an established amount. So in your scratch space, right, we don't actually have 10 terabytes to give to every user on the system, right? To actually ensure that users can, you know, store as much data as possible, this space is actually purged after every 120 days, right? So any like data sets you have, right, you're gonna want to go ahead and compute against them, right? And it's good to go, but you wanna get all that data off scratch, right? Or, so it's not like a permanent space. Right. If you leave anything on scratch, it will be removed forever. We can't get it back. Right. And like I used to work at CU and we've had a lot of physicists like very upset losing a ton of information in scratch because our purge policy over there was 90 days. So yeah, great question though. Thank you so much for asking and bringing that point up. Yeah. So scratch is purged. Please, please, please. After you do your computations, right. Get anything important off scratch, right. Get it backed up get in a spot where you're in, you're ensuring that's in a safe location. Is that a question? No? Okay, awesome. Okay, cool. Okay. So we actually, so I'm gonna go ahead and show us our next command here, which is gonna be snap ls, right? So that backup that I said in home directory, right? You can use this application, right, called snap ls to actually get a summary of all the different like um, snapshots you essentially have. I'm just gonna go ahead and copy like this command here, right, the first bit to show you all what it looks like. So uh, Mia, there was a question of when does the 120 days start for each user? And Ben just responded, 120 days is measured from last access time, example stale, data yeah so essentially i believe what it is is you that 120 days is again like accessing the file right so if you don't compete against the file right or if you're not competing against the file if you don't like you know make any modifications or any changes to the file right then you're going to lose the data right so yeah it's on file creation so be very careful about that right just you know that's when the timing like the time stamp hits don't worry, it's like a script that comes through and like scrubs everything. It doesn't dump everything every 120 days. It just like scrubs through occasionally, right? Checks to see, oh, this file's really old. I'm gonna get rid of it, right? So yeah, don't worry too much about having the entire space dumped. It's just the scrubbing of a script. Okay, cool. So we're gonna go ahead and take a look at this application called Snap LS, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and change directory to home, right? And then we're gonna run the command Snap LS, right? So we'll go and run it. And you can see this is a list of all the snapshots that we have organized by date, right? So you can see that we have one for the 18th, the 19th, the 20th, 21st, 22nd, so on and so forth, right? And they actually get incrementally smaller. And it's going to be easier for me to show you over here because the text is a little bit big there. But yeah, you can see like the tech or the way it's actually organized, right, is that we have like hourly backups, right, that get purged every now and then, right? So we have hourly backups to make sure like if you do something very important within like an hour, you can go ahead and pull it up. We have daily backups, right? And then, yeah, I think it goes up to about a week. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Great resource. Um, yeah, I've used it to save a lot of information that people like accidentally delete and then like, you know, need like some configuration file back. So 
yeah, make sure you take a look at it if you do need it. Okay, and this is Glade Quota again. I already showed you this one, so I won't go ahead and show it, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, last thing I'll bring about um, storage here is going to be campaign storage. Do you have a question? Or, yeah, okay. Like where the backup file goes? Oh, uh, what was that? Oh, the backup files? Yeah. So the backup files are actually in a secret directory here, right? So I'll show you the secret directory, but you got to keep it a secret, okay? <laughs> um, so it's in this directory, right? So Glade U Home, right? So the prefix of like your home directory, right? If we actually scroll up a little bit, right, you'll see it. Here, right? So Glade U Home, right? And it's in a directory called dot snapshots, right? And then your username. Okay. That's where all the backups are. Dot snapshot, no space username. Yeah. So here, I'll just go ahead and navigate to it. Glade U Home dot snapshots, right? And then M Trahan. Oh, date stamp. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, whatever date stamp we want. Um, yeah, we'll do that one. And then, then you can go ahead and just select every hand here. Okay, and you can go ahead and see, like, if I go ahead and navigate to this directory, you can go ahead and take a look, right? There's an entire clone of my home directory. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, this is the files themselves. Right, so don't yeah. delete anything in here. Right, it's a, it's your backup. Right, so make sure it's good to go. I'm pretty sure you don't even have the permissions to delete it. You just want to CP things from here. Okay. Thank you. So yeah. Cool. Yes. Um, I'm sure you've explained this, but I think I just missed it. So I know home is backed up regularly, and dot snapshots dot snapshots is where these backups are stored. Yep. And so then what's this secret directory that oh, the secret also stored is, in? The secret directory is dot snapshots. So oh oh like yeah. se secret in the sense of it starts with a dot. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks for the questions, everybody. I really love an interactive group. So this is awesome. Okay, lastly, I'll talk about campaign storage, right? This is essentially a specific space for your project to actually have like a group kind of like storage. Um, we will allocate this to you, right, if your project demands it, right? So essentially, you need to submit an application to actually get this. But yeah, it's useful for actually, like, storing data on a publication time scale, right? So if you're, like, planning on publishing something, right, and you need the data to exist for a really long time, then you can sign up for campaign storage, right? And then essentially get your workflow all good to go and have it in a safe place. Yep. Now, one thing to note here, right, notice something really important here. And campaign storage is not mounted to uh, to Cheyenne. So this is like what I was saying earlier, right? Like it's not globally accessible, right? Like a like a directory not completely accessible in their different locations, right? You want to go ahead and transfer any files, right, from Cheyenne to campaign storage using Globus. Okay. So just FYI here, right? Cheyenne is not uh, Cheyenne does not have campaign storage mounted. Yes. Question. Yes. Yes. It's, we're planning on it. So uh, is the idea with campaign storage, like this is for long-term storage of things that are too large to be stored on you slash home? Um, yeah, essentially. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's like, say you have like a data or say that you have like some Apple or some data that you want to go ahead and publish later on. Right. And you need a long-term storage location for it. This is kind of where that space will end up going. Right, it's for those workflows, right? So publication time scale kind of workflows, right? So you start off with something, you fill it up, right? And it lasts years and years. Okay, and besides, uh, besides like the larger amount of space available, like what what's the what's the difference between the kind of storage offered by campaign storage versus like the backup storage offered by you slash home? Um, I think it's just capacity. Okay. Yeah, it's primarily just capacity, right? So technically the backup storage in home, if you could fit everything in home, you could technically store it there, but we don't really recommend it because it's not very large. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, question. So you might have mentioned it uh, before, but what is Globus again? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to get to that in a little bit here, right? And I'm going to show you the cool web interface and stuff like that. But yeah, um, let me just hold on to that question and we'll get there. 
Lastly, I will talk about collections. So we do have a bunch of shared data sets too available for our people. Um, so I don't know if y'all have heard of RDA or CMIP, um, but these are large kind of data conglomerates, right? Or, and essentially we store a lot of this data on our system locally, right? So you can access them without any issues. If you want more data, right? That's not like say that CMIP 6 has more like data that we haven't pulled in yet, right? You can actually contact us and we can go ahead and get that data for you. Okay, cool. And I need to start like trucking through this because I think we have like 20 more slides. Okay, Globus, thank you. All right, so first off, very short or very shortly, right? If you have a small file to transfer over, right? And you're really lazy, you can just SCP it, right? SCP just stands for secure copy, right? Yeah, it's efficient. It's totally efficient. It's totally understandable. If you're doing anything above a gig, a gig though, I would really recommend using Globus instead because you're gonna be waiting there for like, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. And if anything goes wrong, you lose the entire transfer process. So yeah. Um, small files, please, SCP, SFTP, right? It'll help you out, it's fast and simple, right? You can be nice and lazy with it. Now, let's say you are transferring like maybe one terabyte of, you know, some sort of data, uh, some sort of data set onto like the system, right? And if you ran SCP on it, it would probably run for like two days, <laughs> right? You don't wanna do that because if your computer shuts down at any of that point, right? If you fall asleep out of exhaustion, right? Then you're gonna be pretty upset when the file transfer ends or fails at 95%, right? And, you know, because your computer fell asleep or something, right? For this, you want to use Globus, right? Globus, I'll go ahead and go to the directory or go to the website here. Globus is a larger kind of conglomerate that a lot of different universities and research institutions use for data transfer, right? I'll go ahead and get logged in here. Oh, this is my old folder information here. I don't think I've actually accessed this on NPAR yet, but let's see. So you'll go ahead and get your NCAR credentials in here, right? So go ahead and put those in. Okay, maybe I don't have this password set up yet. I don't know, I haven't actually utilized uh, um, Globus here at NCAR yet, but I'll go ahead and use my old credentials from CU to just like kind of give you a preview of what it looks like. Uh, yeah, we're gonna skip this, apologies. Yeah, um, so when you do log in with Globus, right, then you would need to go ahead and like, essentially it can, brings up a web interface, right, that you could go ahead and access, and then you just transfer files using the web interface. Apologies, I'm not having that set up for y'all, but yeah, it's a really cool interface. And what's really cool is that if you stop your, or if your computer shuts down for any reason, right, it will actually maintain the progress of your transfer. So when you log back in, it will continue that process. Okay, so yeah, make sure you use it. Globus is awesome if you do need to move it. Cool. Um, yes, question. Thank you. I tried all my CIT information, but still cannot log in. It is saying to enter my NCAR RDA user email and password. Yeah, I, I need, to... need to set up a very specific thing for that. I haven't actually set it up either. I so, see. Yeah, and you might not get privileges to actually access it yet. I see. Thank you. Yep. Okay, moving on. Um, Let's talk about available software now. So first off, I'm gonna go ahead and show us a few commands here, right? So just generally, here's some categories of stuff that we have. Um, we have compilers, of course, right? So if you need to compile anything, then we have much available for you. We have debuggers and performance tools, right? So stuff like DBT or MAP. We have MPI libraries, right? MPI libraries is essentially like the process that actually allows you to do like your kind of distributed workflow against like larger kind of like clusters and things like that because most applications just want to run on a single core, right? 
you have IO libraries like NetCDF, NetCDF or ACF5, if you've ever heard of those, those are all like, um, like file transfer kind of stuff, right? Not file transfer, but file accessing kind of that stuff. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> we have analysis languages, right? So if you have Python, Julia, R, IDL, MATLAB, or things like that, right? And you got it here. Um, and some convenience tools and many, many, many others. Uh, and you can check, take a look over here, but I don't like to do that. I usually just like to go ahead and pull the list up on, this, on the machine itself. And you can do that using a few of the commands called, or a few of the commands under this application called lmod. Okay. So all you do is you're gonna type module and you'll type avail actor, module avail. Module is gonna be the prefix for any kind of modules that you wanna have, right? So you, this is like the command that tells, hey, like I want to be doing something with the software right now, right? So you wanna have module in there every time. And then avail is the command that spec and specifically like shows you all the stuff inside. So we're gonna go ahead and take a look at all the software we have. You can see we have a ton of it, all right? I'm just gonna go ahead and click through this, right? But yeah, you can see that there's a ton of different software for you to select from, right? Um, if you want to type module avail. So it should just be the keywords module avail. Try typing that on and it should do the exact same thing or most of the same things. But yeah, this is just a list of all the software here, right? And this goes into our next kind of point. And do you have a question? Yeah, okay. Yeah, what is the difference between module is loaded and default module? Yeah, so a default module is a module that would load by default just by logging in, right? But a load, like a loaded module is anything else, right? So if you load anything, right, it's gonna actually have like multiple little steps. Or are you talking about the D here? The default is actually like, if you type like module load HDF5, it'll go ahead and get that basic HDF5 in there. Okay, I run the Fortran codes in the Cyan, so there is no Fortran mentioned here. Um, Fortran, uh, so we have compilers here for most of the Fortran workloads. So if you're compiling Fortran code, then you'd wanna pull up GNU, which is GCC, right? Or Intel, which is, you know, ICC or whichever you're comfortable with. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right, awesome. So yeah, this is all handled by LMOD's environment modules, right? It's a nice little feature, right? There's a ton of different commands that are actually associated with this, right? Uh, module list shows you all the modules you currently have loaded, right? So by default, you'll have a set, right? A module avail shows you everything, right? That you have available to load. Module load and module unload, Rick loads and unloads the requested software. So say that you want like, GNU, right? You do module load GNU. Module swap will go ahead and switch different versions. Module purge removes all of your specific software. And then we have some cool ones here, right? Module save and module restore. So if you just have like this really complicated workflow, right, with a ton of different like modules that you need specifically loaded, right, and you don't want to run it or load it every single time, right, then you'll you can go ahead and use this module save command to save all of them in a nice list, right? And you can just do module restore, whatever the name that you give it is. And it'll go ahead and restore all those modules for you. Yes. Can you use that module restore in a job script? Yeah, I think so. Okay, to like load all the modules for yeah. JavaScript in one way. Yeah, it's all just based on your home directory. There's a specific folder, right, that contains all these like avail, like a, like a, it's like a list of different modules that you want in this collection, right? So you can go ahead and use module restore in your home directory, not in your home directory, but you can just use module restore and it'll go ahead and check through that directory and be like, oh, there it is, and it'll go ahead and do it. So it doesn't matter where it is. It's in a job, in, like in a home directory, wherever. So even if your um, job script is not located in that home directory, it'll still check the users. Yeah, it shouldn't matter. You should be good to go. Thank you. Okay, cool. And lastly, we have module spider, right? Yes, question. Well, maybe it's gonna be your answer to my question is connected to spider. So if I needed a conda environment, how do I do it? That is a little bit different. And I really am glad you asked that because I don't think there's actually a slide in here for conda. So awesome question. I will go ahead and show us after we talk about spider really fast, okay? So yeah, module spider go ahead and goes ahead and searches for specific software. 
Okay, I'm not going to go through every single one of these because we're kind of down for time here. We only got 30 minutes left. So I will just go ahead and move into like the next kind of point here, right? You, if you want to, feel free to plan along with these. Um, I'm going to talk about conda environments really quick. So conda environments, right? We actually have a few conda environments built in by default, right? And these are actually listed in a different location. What you want to do, right, is you want to go ahead and first load conda. So you'll do module load conda, right? This will go ahead and load our system pods and conda module for you, right? And you should be able to start running conda commands. So we can do conda env list, right? And this will go ahead and show all the conda environments we have available. You can see we have stuff like MPL or R or you know whatever you like. And then I have a bunch of test ones I've done for people because I've always I like building conda environments because it's really fun. <laughs> but yeah. If you do like Conda and you're really into like Python workflows and things like that, right, then Conda is here. It's there for you and lots of different uh, environments. Or, yeah, you can make your own. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's like super integrated, right? You don't need to worry about installing mini Conda or whatever, right? You can just go for it. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So just a couple examples here of the module commands. Module avail. Module list. And then you can see that we run this command, which ICC, which goes ahead and shows, like, which I, I have this in person, so you can see. <laughs> so we'll just go ahead and do module load Intel, right? Oh, sorry, I shortened it. <laughs> Intel, right? And then I can do which ICC. And you can see that this is actually tied to the module here, right? It's actually inside our specific module tree, right? So this is a very specific version. And if I wanted a different version, right, say that I want, like, Intel 20 something, right? Then I could go ahead and load that instead. So we'll go ahead and do this. Module load Intel slash 20, 2022.1. Okay, and I'm actually gonna do this in shorthand so you guys get this little shortcut in case you wanna use this later on, right? So secretly you can hide this, right? You can just do ML and it'll go ahead and shorthand it. You can see we'll go ahead and end reloaded from the version change right to 2021 and if I go or 2022 and if I go ahead and do which ICC again you'll see that we shifted over from the directory we had prior okay yes thanks so much do we also have access to pip or are we just encouraged to use the Conda. I really encourage people. So I, I don't just strongly encourage people to use Conda. I like demand people use Conda. Like it's just so much easier to actually manage things instead of PIP. That being said, if you want PIP, you can get PIP. Um, <laughs> I won't judge you, but it's okay, right? Like, but yeah, um, yeah. That's generally why I recommend, right? You make a custom conda environment and then you can do pip installs there, right? Because what pip does is it's gonna go ahead and try to like do kind of installations that are a little bit more challenging sometimes, right? But I'm just wondering is. Yeah. Uh -huh. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering because um, on other systems I've worked on, like they have, you have access to pip, but it installs locally. So, like, if, you know, you run permissions. Yep, um, and that so. happens here too. Um, the situ so you can actually there's like specific directions you can do with pip right like pip dash dash user right that will install in like your prefix directory right or you can actually do pip prefix but it's kind of a pain to actually like manage like if you've actually tried it you're you would be like okay I just want to use conda now but um yeah so there's like different things you can do but it needs to be modified unfortunately pip is going to be a global installation if you try to load like python in here and then try to run pip yes. any system is that if you use pip and conda together it's a dangerous practice and it's very like it's recommended to be avoided and the reason is that conda is not aware of what's happening with pip and pip might change the package versions for some of your packages and then uh, conda is not aware of it so that will basically easily break your environment and you can see like your environment is not working that's why we recommend people avoid pip um, and that's like good practice also for your stuff as well. Yes, question. Looks like you're working in your snapshot directory. Is there a way to restore that snapshot? 
Um, yeah, so all you do from restoring your snapshot directory, you would just go ahead and see the any files that you would want to restore. If you want to restore the entire directory, you just copy that to your home directory and then make sure everything's cleaned out. Oh, great question, thank you. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, awesome. Cool. All right, I think that's pretty much it with regarding modules, right? Um, module swap will go ahead and swap versions. And yeah, that's basically it. So yeah, um, next kind of major point of contention that I've seen a lot of people like try to use and then like get kind of, you know, messed up by it. So if, so I know people like to modify their bash RCs, right? Or their kind of dot profile kind of directories, right? In order to like get things automatically loaded on the system. Do not do that. I please, 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 please do not do that, right? Um, I've had it where like something happens with the module environment, right? And like say LMOD breaks or something, right? And if it breaks, you're not gonna be able to log in, right? So it's a huge mess if you do include like any kind of default modules, like you include this module load stuff in your uh, bash RC. Instead, try to do the module save thing I showed earlier, right? So you can create like a collection of modules that you can go ahead and restore easily inside of a job. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Lastly, I'll talk about the Ankara compiler module, right? So you might not understand what this module is. It's kind of a weird one, but essentially what it is is to help you essentially get all of your paths kind of lined up, right? So the module or so you don't need to think too much about actually doing the compilation so there's a lot of specific variables that go into compiling codes right like ld library paths and stuff like that right and some of them are actually handled by the module right so what this will do it's going to go ahead and do like link a bunch of different environment variables that are commonly used right to make your compilation process much easier right so i always recommend having our compilers loaded alongside whatever additional libraries or whatever uh, additional compilers. It does all the linking for you. So yeah, use NCAR compilers, please. Okay, cool. Jobs, um, I am, okay, we have, a, we, have, we have a good amount of time. So who here knows what a job is? Okay, that's good. Okay, so I'm gonna go over what a job is in general before we get into batch jobs. So in general, a job is simply an allocation of resources given to you at a certain time, right? And all it is is saying this section of the computer is yours, right? Go ahead and run whatever you want on it, right? We have a lot of different ways of actually running these things, but the most common is called a batch job, right? Now a batch job, I like to think of it like a batch of cookies, right? You have a tray of cookies, right? And you wanna, you know, it's a batch of cookies, right? And you put in the oven, Right, you step away for like 50 minutes or something, come get it and then pull it out and then bam, you have cookies, right? So that's the way I kind of think of it, right? You submit a job to the supercomputer, the supercomputer crosses that information, you come back later and you pull out whatever information you came in. Actually, it kind of dumps it already into your directory, so you don't need to pull it out, but it's there for you. Okay, awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, so this is essentially how you're going to access the specific compute on the machine. You don't actually do any like SSA training to specific nodes. All you do is you get these jobs, right? You set up a job script and you'll go ahead and submit it and I'll go ahead and run in the background, right? And pop it out, right? And you'll get your answers. Uh, yes, question. Um, could you say again what the difference is between a job and a batch job? Okay, so a job is like a larger category of everything, right? And a batch job is just a type of job, right? Where you just kind of submit it, push it into the oven and pull it out. Okay, as opposed to other types of jobs yeah. that would require like constant interaction? Yeah, like an interactive job, right? Is a constant interacting, action, interaction, right? Like you're moving toy or something, right? You need to be there constantly, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great question, so. Any other questions? So yeah, um, when you go ahead and submit like these jobs, right, it's gonna be passed along to Cheyenne or Casper's compute nodes known uh, using something called PPS, all right? PPS is basically just a overarching system that'll go ahead and manage all the resources, right? And give everything out evenly to all the users in the system. Okay, 
Um, jobs that request a very specific amount of compute tasks and estimated wall time will be placed on specified hardware, right? So if you need like, you know, a specific amount of time, right, and a specific amount of memory, it'll go ahead and automatically determine which node is best for your job. All right, and jobs use something called core hours, right, which are gonna be charged against your project slash account fee. So core hours are essentially, um, it's really simple, right? So the amount of cores times the amount of hours your application runs on, right? So you'll have a specific amount of core hours actually allocated to your project, right? And that's gonna be pulled out. So it'll be subtracted every single time you run a job, right? They'll go ahead and, you know, like say that you have like a hundred core hour job, like 10 cores, right, for 10 hours, right? And you have, you've made a hundred core hours, right? That'll be subtracted from your total, okay? Yes. Suppose I assigned uh, five hours, core hours, but ultimately it takes only three hours. So how much it will be subtracted from my project? Um, Suppose I uh, assign five hours in the job submission, but it ultimately takes only three hours. So how much it will subtract from my That's project? That's a great question. Only the three hours. So, yeah. but the issue is that if you do five hours, you request five hours and it doesn't use our like you want to get it as close as possible because you're waiting in queue until that job submits, right? So if there's a ton of people in line for you, right? Then you're, the longer your job is, the longer it's going to take to actually get into the queue, right? So say that you're running like an enormous job, you're using like 4,000 nodes, right? For 24 hours, and it's going to take forever to go through, right? And yeah, but you're only charged for the amount you use. You're never going to get charged for anything uh, that you specify. Okay, great question though. Thanks so much. All right, and here's an example of what a job script, or what I was talking about, talking about prior, a job script is. All right, so you need to construct one of these things, right, in order to actually do a batch job, right? And all it is is essentially a bunch of commands, right, uh, prepended by a bunch of different, like, flags here that actually tell, like, the scheduler, hey, I want to have these specific features of my job, okay? I would like to break it into three components. You have, like, your flags up here, you have like module commands and then kind of set up of like directories and things like that, right? And then you have whatever commands you actually want to use inside the application. So it's usually like those three major components. Okay, cool. I know some of these flags are a little bit complicated, right? Like there's dash Joe OE, right? That is kind of weird, right? But all that one's really specifying is like your output kind of information and how it's gonna be classified. Right, so a lot of these stuff you can just copy directly over, like the dash K and dash J. Um, dash Q stands for whatever kind of quality of service you want, right? So if you want something that happens faster, right, you'll actually get charged more, right, for that, right? So this is like a factor actually multiplying against your core hours, right? So if you want priority access, you can actually get that, but you're gonna get charged a little bit more, right? If you say that you don't really care and you're like, okay, well, I don't really care when this runs, this is gonna take a little bit longer, right? I'm not in a big rush. So you can specify something with lower priority and get charged less. Okay, yes. Um, so then in order to submit a job, it seems like we should know ahead of time, like an upper bound on the runtime of the job? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so okay. I always try to have an upper boundary. What I like to do is I like to have like an estimate, right, of however long I expect the job to be. And I add like 10 or 20 percent, right, to make sure that job doesn't accidentally like die. Because if it dies, right, and doesn't finish, you still charge that amount, right? Okay. Yeah, so you got to be careful with it. Make sure that you ensure that that 20 percent is there, right, so you have a buffer room in case anything goes horribly wrong. Okay, so if I say I mess up when figuring out the upper bound and my the clock runs to zero before my job is done, then does it just like dump the memory, I lose everything, but I'm still charged? Yep. Okay. So it's scary. Okay. Thank you. You mentioned without using the login mode, you need to have a account number to use this kind of thing. Where is it? place to put in that number? Yeah, so the account oh. number goes into the dash A field, right? You see the project code that you'll you'll have a project code, right? When you get your account on SSL, right? You will go ahead and use that, right? As your like charging factor, right? So whatever you have inside that account will go ahead and get charged against. Thank you, yeah. including that. Uh... Yeah, the bra so get rid of the brackets, right? 
but you don't need like the triangle. So oh, I see. usually what we do, right? If you ever see this out in the wild, right? The little triangles, right? That's generally just to indicate replace this entire thing, right? I Get see. rid of the entire thing and just Thank use you. whatever project that you have. Okay. And I'll go ahead and actually pull up an example script really quick, right? Or actually, I think this is what works in an example script. But I'll show you like, you know, what my project code is. I think it's like SCSD0001, right? So all it is is dash A, right, space, and then SD, SCSD, so on and so forth. Okay. Cool. All right. Yes, questions? So the one shop does not mean the comment. Uh, what was that? The, the shop. Oh, yes, the the hashtag. So, okay. yeah, the, the pound sign slash has, hashtag, right? That's actually a comment in the script, right? Except for this first one. The very first one's always required, right? So have that slash bin slash bash or slash bin slash tch. All that's saying is, like, telling the computer, oh, yeah, this is uh, what shell I want this to limit in. But, yeah, everything else, like the hashtag PDS or whatnot, Right, all that is is a comment inside the code. So the application, so the uh, the shell won't run this. The shell's gonna be like, oh, that's just a comment. That's just a comment, right? But when it's put through PDS, right? PDS will look and say, oh, there's a PDS flag. I need to check that, right? So all it is is basically like comments that tell flags that PDS needs to do stuff. Yes, question. Do they have to Im put it in order? Um, you don't need an order. It can be in any order. So if you wanted to, right, you could have project code at the very top. Right, you could have just your boilerplate stuff with dash J and dash K. You could have your quality of service, right? Whichever you want, like it doesn't matter in which order you have it. You just need to have it like at the top of the script. Uh, do I need to put in um, input for every one of them as well? Nope. So there's a default value for a lot of these things, right? Like dash J and dash K, I believe already have default outputs, right? So if you want to leave those entirely blank, right, then you'll get the default output for it. Um, stuff like project code, though, is absolutely necessary. So stuff like that, right, you might require. But other stuff, like, say, you don't even care about the name of the job, right? Like, dash N stands for name. Then you'd be like, oh, I can skip that, right? And then kind of hard to account for. But yeah. Yes, question? This is going back a little bit. But to clarify, are you charged for the predicted wall clock time or the actual wall clock time yeah so it's core count against wall clock right so what it is right is the amount like so however job however long your job like runs for exactly right so the exact second times however many cores you have or get charged okay so it's not like you know how much time you're used right it's the exact amount of time you use times the amount of cores you've used okay yes Is that a linear relationship between like CPU usage and charge quantity, or like if your job is bigger, do you like get it? It's linear. Okay, it's cool. absolutely linear unless you use uh, a higher priority uh, quality of service, in which case there'll be another factor multiplied onto that, right? But it's all linear in that kind of sense, right? Like you're never gonna get like larger, larger job, right? Gets extreme like charge on it, right? It's always like directly proportional. Yes. You probably have mentioned this before. Others um, set a directory to export into a scratch thing reminds me about my question about the purge policy. Did you mention that the purge policy is facing towards all everything inside the, the scratch or only the script? So the scratch policy is only set towards any file that exceeds 120 days from file creation. That's right? all the files, right? Yeah, it's not gonna purge everything in the file if it, like one file hits 120 days, right? It's just gonna go through and search to see any file that's old, right? And delete that one specific file, right? So you need to worry about all your data just like getting thrown out on a specific day, right? It all happens like gradually, right? We have a script that runs through every hour to make sure everything's good to go. So if you export, for example, the data output per uh, hour, for example, in this directory, you're going to do, like, say, in 100, 120 days to at least read it to avoid being deleting? Yep. So you, well, you don't want to do any kind of modification to it. Like, that's not going to solve it, right? It's on file creation. So any, like, issue that you end up having, right? So, like, if you do any kind of edits to it, then 
it's still not going to change the fact that the file is like created super old, right? So you want to make you want to make sure to get rid of those files after like 120 days. You're saying reading it only is not really changing the. Yeah, it's not changing anything. That's not doing it. Then it's not going to go ahead and. Uh, then if I'm going to to keep this for longer than 120 days, what is the best uh, solution to do that, in your opinion? Well, so the real thing you should do is, uh -huh. you know, try to move the file over again. Uh -huh. But at the same time, I can understand the data constraints there. So you could, you know, as long as you're like modifying the file and actually doing things with that, then I think you should be good to go. But I really recommend just doing it properly and making sure that you run the or you compute against the data within 120 days. Because generally speaking, if you have the data there, right, you're going to have it like crunched out by 120 days. I see. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. All right, we have a few commands here. Okay, so PPS has very specific commands, right? I don't know why they use Q, but they use Q. Um, yeah, so it's Q sub, right? Q submit. I'm not super sure why it's Q, but yeah, you can submit a script using Q sub, right? And I'll go ahead and submit a batch job, right? So that's how you do your batch jobs. You can use Q stat to go ahead and find specific information about like whatever job that you have, right? So say that you have a job that is, you know, that you're kind of interested in, like to see like any kind of stats of like how long it ran, right? Or if it failed or any kind of information about that, then you can use Q stat the status of the job. You can use Q interactive to run an interactive job, right? So that one again, like this actually changes a little bit when you get on the Casper too. I'm not gonna go into too much detail there because I don't actually recommend people use interactive jobs too frequently, right? But yeah, if you want to like do like a large compilation or something kind of interactive, then that's where it usually ends up being. We have Q command, right? This is a single command on the compute node. Um, I rarely ever use this, but sometimes it's really useful to like, if you're doing like, I don't know, like some really basic compilation or, you know, a test on a file, right? Or like, say you're just trying to test a script or something, right? Then you can do that there using Q command. And then Q hist just brings up all the logs for any kind of stuff you have. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, does the Q command also submit to a Q, or is like, is it kind of just go straight into? So yes, um, Q command I think has default. So all the all the flags I showed you here, right, on the previous slide, right, dash n dash o dash a whatever, right, these can all be bound to, uh, like Q command or Q interactive and things like that, right? Like those are flags that you know these this uh, script will go ahead and parse out and pull through. But at the same time, right, most of the time people don't really care about that, right? They just want to get their job in, right? So they will like write kind of a small kind of prompt here, right? And only use their account. So that's kind of why the reason why we have this dash A. But yeah, you can specify things to the granular level. If you want like your quality of service or anything like that, right? Then yeah, you could have that. Uh, regarding QHIST, that we just have to type QHIST to get the, all those finished jobs. Yep, so I can go ahead and run this here. I don't think I've run any jobs with it. No, so this is everybody in QHIST, right? And then we can actually do any kind of more information here, right? So I'll just go and type help so you can see additional parameters here, right? But you can specify like any jobs, your specific job name, or if you want like a specific user, things like that, right? And you can go ahead and start that out. Um, QHIS will print out every job that's run in the past like day or so. Uh, whatever job I have done for last one year, two years, so everything. One year, two years. Um, that's with the dash T flag. You can actually set a time frame. Actually, no, that's time format. Uh, let me see the other one. Yeah, dash. Yeah, so dash D or period. Um, it's mostly. I think I. Yeah, dash P is also another one. So you can actually search for frames or dates. But yeah, there's there's everything in here if you do want to pull up more information. And if some job finished incompletely with some error, so what will happen? It will so so all that? Like if any job like doesn't complete properly, stop due to some reason or errors, then it will also show in QHIST or Yep, it ends up being in QHIST, right? So if I go ahead and do this QHIST again, right, you can I'm sure we can see some failed jobs in here as well, right? 
right? I, I'm pretty sure they can actually specify like whether or not there's actually like errors or things like that. But yeah, it'll pop up in here. It's literally every job. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, um, so moving back over to here, right? Another example PBS submission here, right? Say that you create a script called batch dot or basic dot to underscore PBS dot SH, right? And then you could go ahead and submit it using PSUB here, right? And then that'll go ahead and give you whatever uh, thing it's actually passed to in terms of scheduler, right? And then after that, you'll go ahead and you can check it using PSAC. Okay. I'm not going to go too much into the details of this, right? Because I'm sure the workflow is pretty apparent, but. Okay, so I'm going to like try to speed through the last of this stuff, okay? Cool. Another example is JavaScript, if you want to take a look at it at your own leisure. Um, you should be able to get these slides in a little bit, but yeah, another example. And lastly, we're going to get to data analysis and any other additional features we can talk about, because there's a lot of interesting stuff that I want to actually present to you all before we actually conclude today. So Jupyter Hub, like I know a lot of people like Conda environments, right? Well, you can actually tie those Conda environments to Jupyter Hub, right? To run an interactive application, right? Using either R or Python or whatever that you want to have, right? It's super useful. Um, yeah, it you can run whatever Jupyter notebook you want to have in there, right? We have it's a super popular currently, and we actually have some users that exclusively use it, right? So I do recommend this. This is a really useful resource. I'll also ask to see whether or not or where you want to actually run things, right? If you want to like run things really quickly, then you would specify like, you know, what login nodes or Casper or something, right? But if you want like more dedicated resources for a long-term job, you can actually specify a batch node and then like set up parameters for a batch job. Okay. And yeah, I'm not going to go through too much of the details of this because I know you all have probably used JupyterHub in some sort of capacity, but it's really, really useful, right? Um, you can actually open up a shell in here too if you really wanted to, and, and like everything like conjoined in this nice little package if you want to use it. We also have VNC if we have users that are like advanced enough to start using stuff like that. Um, VNC is essentially a like a remote desktop that you can actually pull up, right? So say that you want like a Casper login node and you want to do things like in a desktop environment. You can use VNC, right? Can actually pull that up and generate a VNC window. Now the commands for this are a lot more complicated, so you're not going to get too much here, right? But generally speaking, you're going to go ahead and launch VNC Manager on Casper, right? And then you're going to want to set up your VNC client correctly, right? And then connect those two. Okay, so that one's a lot more complicated. I, generally speaking, I don't usually use this too frequently, but it's an option if you are very interested in VNC. And lastly, we have a remote desktop called CraftX. Um, this is actually a web browser interface, right, for interactive kind of workflows, right? So if you want a desktop environment and you don't want to deal with, you know, needing to set up VNC or, you know, going through Jupyter Hub or whatever, right, then you can actually go through FastX, right? Now, one thing to note, FastX is only available through NCAR VPN, right? So please be connected to the NCAR VPN. And then once you actually have access to this, right, then you can go ahead and set up a very specific like OS kind of flavor here, right? Or like whatever kind of display you want, and it'll just be a remote desktop inside a browser. No VNC setup, nothing. It's good to go. Yes. How can we start MATLAB in Jupyter Hub? MATLAB in Jupyter Hub. Okay. Um, I believe there's kernels for that, but. I'll go ahead and go to Jupyter Hub here. I'm not super sure if we have kernels for MATLAB. We do? Okay, so there's kernels in there. I'll go ahead and show us because I think we have a little bit more time than I was expecting. But, um, let's see. Oh. Okay. Okay, there we go. So I can go ahead and start a server here, right? And this will go ahead and set this all up for me, right? Sorry, this is being super slow. 
But yeah, inside you'll see like little windows in here, right? So I'll go ahead and launch the server, uncheck the login. And then you'll see like little boxes in there that tell you what application you can actually spawn in. So it's gonna go ahead and say, oh yeah, the server's starting up. Okay, I'm gonna like start moving on because, and we'll check to see this afterwards, right? So yeah, we'll see if it like gets it up by the time it actually goes. Okay, but yeah, that's pretty much all of what I got for this. I do wanna like point out requesting help or how to contact us if you have any additional questions, right? So first off our documentation page, once, once again, right? This is the documentation page. I really recommend reading through this if you want any other refreshers. And do you have any more complicated questions or like just want to say hi or whatever, then you can pass us along a ticket over here at Sysil Help Desk, right? It's a nice little interface, right? You can go ahead and send us a little message and one of us will get to you. There's a dedicated staff member currently uh, available for your interaction like every single day, right? From eight to five. So yeah, if you do need help, then please, please, please reach out. And lastly, there's some HPC tutorials here. If you want some more interactive tutorials that are a bit guided, then HPC tutorials are the way to go. But yeah, tons of stuff here, recommend them. Um, yeah, and lastly, some best support. Uh, yeah, best practices for support. Um, yeah, what you wanna do in your support tickets is always specify what resource you're using. Give us an exact error message, like an exact one, just copy and paste it, right? Um, where your batch is or where your batch script is. Um, your PDS job ID, right? And then after that, um, any kind of like, anything you previously sourced or any kind of like directories that this is all located in. Okay. Oh yeah, and any other pertinent information like, you know, when this actually happened or, you know, like this happened like four days ago or something, right? So yeah, help us figure out where exactly your issues are. Okay, but yeah, that should be pretty much everything. Um, does anyone have any more questions before I hop back to the Jupyter Hub Extension thing to see if it works? Yes. Um, I had a question about module lo uh, loading and saving. So do I have to uh, load and save modules like or, or load modules every time I log in? Yeah, so unless you do the module save and module restore command, right, you're gonna have to load that entire set of modules. So I really recommend doing um, like get your modules all loaded, right? Run a module save, right? And give it whatever fun name that you want, right? Like happy modules or whatever, right? And then you can do module restore happy modules, right? And it'll go ahead and load everything up for you without needing to actually do any kind of like stuff. Could Jupyter Hub be used in batch mode? Um, In batch mode, yes. So yeah, so actually, yeah, this is it. Okay, so we're actually in. But yeah, on this like selection screen, if I actually start another server, I can actually spe specify something in a drop down menu, a batch job, right? And then that'll go ahead and wait in queue to actually get that resource that they're looking for, right? But yes, you can have batch missions as well. Yep. Um, any more questions? Yes. Are there any restrictions on how many resources we can request for a job, Num number of cores or number of GPUs? Um. I think it's pretty much open in terms of what you can request. It's just fair share is gonna limit you in terms of how much like people are requesting it. So if you request like a boat, like the entire supercomputer, right? You could technically do that, but it's gonna take forever in queue to actually get through. So yeah, we, we, we have run a system called fair share that actually balances all these jobs, right? So yeah, just make sure that like you're using the very specified what kind of resource the GPU need, right? So you don't have to wait too long. And regarding the time allocation that we have, the time code that we have remaining, is it visible on the uh, SAM? Yep, so you'll see the exact amount of core hours on SAM, right? If I go back to SAM here, you can actually see, if I go ahead and click uh, my account statements here, right? So you can see that I have my own like accounts here, right? You can see the allocation set to 1 million here on Cheyenne. Right, and we have this mine as a group, right? You'll have your own that you have access to in this specific location. Okay, yes, awesome. Any other questions? How to get the NCAR VPN? NCAR VPN, um, I don't think I'm equipped to answer that question, but 
uh, NCAR VPN, I think you just like Google this and actually get like the information. Um, I think the support desk downstairs actually is a bit more better of a place to ask for that stuff, right? But I believe they have a website about this, right? You can see VPN access and documentation here, right? Um, yeah, they are a little bit more like equipped in terms of actually getting all these things, all these applications installed. Okay. Any other questions? Are we good? Yes, question. <laughs> um, I have two questions. The first is a pretty common uh, job use case for me is um, sort of like memory restricted. And so I often request like a full node to get the full memory on that node. That results in like really low CPU usage, which I know on like the CP the CU cluster yep. causes me to be like have poor Q performance. Yep. Okay, and so just to like stop you there, right? You don't have to worry about it. You get the full node and you execute the request. So you get the memory and everything good to go, right? It's not like CU. CU was like actually was allocated to like be fully loaded up that thing, right? So people that were requesting all those nodes, right, would get like certain sections of the nodes. Right, so here you do get the full set of memory. I guess maybe that's not my my question is, I think on the CU cluster, you get penalized if you have low CPU usage for your jobs, if you're like over requesting. And so if you're in this scenario where you're not using all your CPUs because you need the full nodes memory, does that happen here? No, okay, that doesn't, good. doesn't happen. Yeah, okay. you're absolutely good, don't worry about it. <laughs> And then my second question is, what do you use X11 forwarding for? X11 forwarding. Okay, so I really don't use too much X11 forwarding, but say you wanted like a MATLAB window or like an R interface, right? You could use X11 forwarding as like a really simplistic way to actually get the thing to view. Um, it's really slow if you're using like, you know, um, I don't know, like Windows or something, right? It's a little bit more of a pain, um, which is kind of the reason why I do recommend using Jupyter or something instead because it's a little bit more robust. Okay, um, I'm out of time here. I do want to show off this Jupyter Lab thing for that one question online. Um, so you can see that we have specific kernels for specific applications in here. So you can just go ahead and select one and I'll go ahead and load up a MATLAB kind of prompt for you. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, thanks everybody so much for coming. It's been wonderful. Um, yeah, I really love the questions, the interactivity. Um, yeah, thank you so much and I really hope to see you. I'm going to stick around for like five minutes after if you have any questions. Yeah, you can email us. It's all about 